All right, welcome to CS uh, 2050. The topic of today is a little extra. Uh, it's called uh, Fermat's Little Theorem. This is the last week we're going to be spending on number theory, and then we have the exam afterwards, right? So today, this week, we're doing Fermat's Little Theorem, as well as uh, Euler's Theorem, uh, the Euler Phi function, and after the break, we're going to do the Chinese remainder theorem, and then we're going to do cryptography on Thursday, RSA. So all basically the last, perhaps even the most difficult parts of uh, number theory. Number theory, again, an elegant and beautiful science. For Matt's little theorem uh, is one of the theorems of all time. Basically, uh, what it says is, and not, this is not to be confused with for Matt's last theorem, but for Matt's little theorem basically says uh, if... Uh, some number a is between 1 and p, uh, and uh, p is prime, then uh, a to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod p. That's all it says. Uh, for Matt's little theorem, incredibly useful, in fact, to, pr to, to do modular arithmetic. And we'll do some examples of uh, proving it later. Equivalently, this can be rewritten as a to the p is congruent to what mod p? Not a rhetorical question. What's the what's the what's a to the p congruent to? A. a. Why? So multiply by a on both yeah, sides. you got to do arithmetic. If that's true, multiply by a on both sides, you get a to the p is congruent to a mod p, right? Uh, we're going to prove for Matt's uh, little theorem, and then we're going to do um, an exercise involving it. So the proof is there's many proofs of Fermat's little theorem. I want to choose the simplest and most elegant one, and this is one uh, that's due to Eric Vigoda. Um, who knows where he got it from? Uh, let uh, S be the set 1, 2, 3, all the way to P minus 1. So it's the elements mod P except for 0. Uh, and let A of S be the set A, 2A, uh, 3A, all the way to P minus 1 times a, uh, each of these mod p. So what you do is you take each element of s, you multiply it by a for some a less than p, and you mod it by p, and then you get this set called as. We're going to first prove a lemma. In order to prove for mass theorem, we're first going to do this introductory lemma, and the lemma is that as is equal to s. So that's what we want to prove first. Once we have proven that AS is equal to S, then actually for Maslow's theorem follows pretty simply. Now, what is really the difference between S and AS? What are we really talking about here? We're really talking about a function uh, from S to S uh, such that F of, uh, I don't know, I is equal to AI mod P, right? You take each element in S, you multiply it by A mod P, and then you get an element of AS, right? But convince yourself that we basically are trying to prove that f of i is a bijection. Right? F is a, to prove s is equal to as, we're really trying to prove that f is a bijection. So we can prove that s equals as if the following two are true. One, so convince yourself that this is true, uh, that as is equal to s if and only if two things. One, zero is not an element of as. And two, uh, the elements of AS are distinct. Now, comment on the second part is that the elements of AS are distinct. Basically, what that means is that, of course, a set has non-distinct, uh, has unique elements anyway. What we mean is if you compute the map, it's injective, essentially. No two elements when you compute f ma map to the same thing, right? Convince yourself that this has to be true, right? If you take every element in S and you m apply the function to it, you're, and you, because you mod by p, you're going to get numbers between 0 and p minus 1 anyway, right? So convince yourself that the two sets have to be equal if and only if 0 is not an element, because when you mod by p, you can get 0. 
but notice that zero is not an element of s. So it's sufficient for us to, that zero, that we prove that zero is not an element of as. And also that the elements are distinct. Basically, not every element, when you compute as mod p, maps to the number two. Right? That's not something we want to happen. So if they are distinct, then there are, at most, p minus 1 elements. Excuse me. There are p elements between 0 and p minus 1. If the, if the elements are distinct, it's a set of p minus 1 elements, and it doesn't contain 0. So it has to be 1 through p minus 1. Right? So we're going to prove that s equals as equivalently by proving 0 is not an element of as, and proving that the elements of as are distinct. Right? Any questions on that, the premise of why you should convince yourself that's true, and why proving those two facts will prove that as is equal to s. Any questions on the setup of the proof yet at all so far? We don't know yet why we need this lemma, but this is what we're trying to prove, that s equals as. Questions? Good? All right, let's prove the first one. We prove 0 is not an element of as. What's the proof strategy we, sh we should begin with? Contradiction. Good, good start. Assume to the contrary. Um, zero is an element of AS. So uh, there exists I such that AI is congruent to zero mod P. Some number S. I mean, excuse me, zero obviously is not a member of S because S is the P minus one elements between one and P minus one. So assume to the contrary that zero is an element of AS. So that means that some element of S when multiplied by A mod P maps to zero. We agree? Um, since of the GCD of A and uh, P is congruent to what? What is the GCD of A and P? Sorry? A mod P. A mod P. The GCD of A and P, that would be, P, that would be well, we know P is a prime. So that may be true by the Euclidean algorithm, but something else we know. And again, A is less than P as well. One. If A is less than P and P is prime, it doesn't, the only divisors of a prime number are one in itself, so it has to be one. Since the GCD of A and P is equal to one, what do we know about A? A is not zero. A is not zero. That's also correct. But in fact, uh, that the A inverse exists. Mod P. Right? A number, the inverse of a number exists if and only if. Uh, A inverse exists mod P if and only if A, uh, the GCD of A and P is equal to 1, right? Only those numbers relatively prime to the number have inverse that exists. So we simply take our equation and multiply both sides by this inverse. We're going to get A inverse A i is congruent to A inverse 0 mod P. And that's going to give us that i is congruent to 0 mod P. But, I mean, i is an element of s, but I don't see any 0 here. Contradiction. If you assume 0 is an element of as, you deduce that 0 must have been an element of s. But this is impossible. Right? Questions on that one? Pretty straightforward. Yes. How do you get from that i equals 0 mod p to i of to 0 belongs in s? Ah, because uh, i is an element of s. Right? The elements of as are simply the elements of s multiplied by a mod p. So when we say that 0 is an element of as, what we mean is that one of these is a 0, but each of these is just mapped to from the previous. So what that means is that ai, for some i in s, is congruent to 0 mod p. So one of these was mapped to by one of those to be 0. But where i is an element of s, it's 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way to p minus 1. But that means that i was just 0. Yeah. 
All right, let's do the next one. Uh, we want to prove that the elements are distinct. So suppose not. Let's suppose not. Assume to the contrary. There exists i and j in S. i does not equal j, but uh, a to the i is congruent to a to the j mod p. Essentially, when you take a, I, a multiply i and j by a, you get the same answer even though a and i and j are distinct, right? Um, again, since uh, the GCD of a p is equal to 1, a inverse exists. So, we know that a inverse a i is congruent to a inverse a j. We multiply the left of those both by uh, a inverse mod p. And that implies, then, that i is congruent to j mod p. Contradiction. Questions on that proof? In fact, a simple proof of injectivity. Trying to go slow and methodical through these. Any questions on that one? I perhaps believe you guys could have done both of these. Very elementary, right? Well, now we've proved that S is equal to AS, right? It's proven. So what can we do with this fact? Let's apply. We proved a sort of a difficult, long lemma. Let's apply the lemma. If two sets are equal, then the product of the elements of the sets are also equal, right? If two sets are equivalent, then the product of S is equivalent to the product of AS. Well, the product basically means you multiply all the elements, mod P. The products of the elements of S are simply 1 through P minus 1, right? So what we mean here really is that we say I is equal to 1 to P minus 1 of I. And again, the capital... Pi basically means take the product of all those. Just the way the sigma means the sum, the, pro the, the pi means product, right? We're familiar with this notation so far. Um, what is the product of all the elements of AS? It's going to be AI. I is equal to 1 to P minus 1 of AI. And these are congruent mod P. You agree? What is the product of I equals 1 to P minus 1, that's going to be uh, 1 times 2 times 3 times that, 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 times p minus 1. And that is going to be congruent to a times 2a times 3a times that, 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 times uh, a times p minus 1. And this is all done mod p. Right? You agree? What is 1 times 2 times 3 times all the way to p minus 1? Yeah, so we get p minus 1 factorial is congruent to, now what is a times 2a times 3a? Notice that multiplication is commutative. You could pull all the a's out. You pull the a's out, you have some number of a's. We'll think about that in a second. But you're left with what? 1 times 2 times 3 times 4. You're left with p minus 1 factorial. And this is all done mod p. Okay. How many a's do you pull out? P minus 1. So we get p minus 1 factorial is congruent to a to the p minus 1 times p minus 1 factorial mod p. Right? Questions on this step so far? Simple calculation, right? What is the GCD of P and P minus 1 factorial? P minus 1. P minus 1. So you are saying that P minus 1 divides into P? But P is prime? 
So it won't be p minus 1? If P is prime, what do you know about the GCD of P in anything? It's going to be 1. It's going to be 1. Why? Because prime numbers are just products of 1 in itself. Exactly. The only divisors of a prime number are 1 in itself. This is a number that is really big, in fact, but it does not, especially does not contain P as a factor. It specifically does not contain p as a factor. No product of 1 through p minus 1 will ever equal p because p is prime. Otherwise, p would not be prime. So the GCD of p minus 1 factorial and p is 1. Right? What, is it, what do you know about this? If the GCD of two numbers is 1, what do you know? The inverse exists. So we'll say p minus 1, oh god, factorial inverse exists. What should we call it? Let's not call it that. Let's call it k. OK. Um, so what we're going to do is simply multiply both sides by k. On the right this time, we get p minus 1 factorial k is congruent to a to the p minus 1, p minus 1 factorial k. And because k is shorthand for this uh, p minus 1 factorial inverse, we can basically do our cancellation now, mod p, and we get what is going to be on the left-hand side here? What is this? One. It's a number times its inverse. They're going to cancel. One is congruent to, and what is that? One, a to the p minus one. Mod p. QED. That's for math there. Questions on the proof? Yes. Um, so it, it's guaranteed that p minus 1 factorial will never be a multiple of p? Convince yourself of that. What is the GCD? First off, the GCD of p and any other number is going to be either, it, recall the GCD of a and b is equal to some d such that d divides into a and d divides into b. But if you set this, if you set b to be a prime, then the only possible numbers that divide into a prime are what? So d can either be 1 or d can either be p. Right? So it must either be 1 or p. Now convince yourself that p minus 1 factorial does not contain p as its own divisor because p is prime. I know this, this isn't true, but if you had like 17, uh -huh. and like for example, like the p minus 1 was like 34, that, that wouldn't be possible. p minus 1 factorial though. So it's 1 times 2 times 3 times 4, all the way to p minus 1. So what is, what is 16 factorial? So GCD of let's say 17 is prime, and what's 16 factorial? Don't know what that is. That's huge. Some big massive number. But I claim that none of those divide into... Uh, 17. What are the factors of 16? 16 factorial, excuse me, is going to be 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 16, right? So, and you want 17. No, no product, no combination, no bunch of those is going to ever be 17 because 17 is prime. If it was not prime, if, if, if it did divide into it, then P would not be prime. But since P is prime, nothing divides into it except P. What if it was like 18 and 17 would be? 17 factorial and 18, mm, that is not true because 9 times 2. No, no, I meant like if it was 17, fact, a 17 and an 18 factorial, would it be um, 17? Because Correct. Why? Because 18 factorial is 1 times 2 times 3 dot, 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 times 17 times 18. It definitely contains 17 as a factor. All right. We've proved for Matt's little theorem. Let's get on to an application of it. More questions on the proof?
right? Again, I think this is a pretty elegant proof. Most proofs of this formal theorem are kind of difficult. I, I just want to mention every, every time we do a proof, I'm going to do like proof commentary. This proof was, I, I credit to Eric Vigoda's notes. Um, and I'm sure he got this from somewhere else or something, but he, a lot of the proofs in, of, of Fermat's theorem involve non-classical, non-simple techniques. So this, I think, is really elegant to convince yourself of the fact that uh, a to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod p, right? Um, you always have to look for the most elegant, most beautiful version of every proof. Now, why is Fermat's little theorem useful? Yeah. Sorry, and when you do the mod p, does that, does that only apply on the, the side that it's? Ah, right. So when we do notation like this, what we really mean is that uh, you should not think of mod, and this is more general comments about modular arithmetic. You shouldn't think of mod as a function that is applied. But rather, when you say, uh, when you write A is congruent to B mod P, what you mean is those are two different strings of symbols, but they map to the same element between 0 and P minus 1, if you were to compute the mod. But this mod P is usually written at the end of the formula, but it's for every single equ equivalence or congruence in the sequence. So when we write it like this, we mean that if you were to take the mod of P minus 1, and if you were to take the mod of A to the P minus 1, times p minus 1 factorial, those are the same. That's the, the mod is for the whole formula in some sense. Sometimes you'll see this written with a little p subscript on the, well, not necessarily p, but an n subscript on the equation, on the congruence itself. Um, another thing I want to say is that uh, the mod, you shouldn't think of it like a function, but rather it is. So rather don't think that if you take a and you mod by p, and then you take b and you mod by p, that you'll get the same thing. Because you may have to mod b several times, right? Rather, you should think that a is b. You're working within a universe of discourse of 0 to p minus 1. Objects outside of that universe of discourse don't exist. There aren't anything, that, you know, I, I always tell this to people, 13 is, is, 13 is not congruent to 3 mod 5. 13 is 3 mod 5. So it's not that these are equal after you apply a function some number of times. It's that they are the same. If you tell me 13, you tell me 3, and I'm working mod 5, I hear the same thing. That's the better way to think of them. With respect to the universe of discourse, they, they can only be identical. Not that they're identical after applying a function, right? This is just sort of a part of the culture, I think. Yeah. Does that answer your question? I think I, OK, good. I think I got confused. Um, right. So the power for Matt's little theorem is that it makes calculation extremely simple. And basically, this is why modular arithmetic calculators work. Uh, here's the example I worked out. You can just Get, take any number between something and a prime and choose any large power of it, mod 7, right? Suppose we want to compute 5 to the 651 mod 7. Uh, a naive approach, which actually some calculators, some old Unix calculators still do this. How, how should a calculator compute this? How should you compute this? What they'll do is they'll first compute 5, then they'll compute that to the 651th power, and then they have this big number, it's stored in RAM, and then afterwards they mod it. But when you're working with modular arithmetic, again, the only, there's only seven items in existence here, 0 through 6. So all arithmetic should be done with respect to 0 to 6, not necessarily going out of bounds and then coming back between 0 and 6. That doesn't really help. So you can apply for Matt's little theorem to this, to actually simplify this, much simpler. Um, 600 and, we, what, what do we know about for Matt's little theorem? We know that a to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod p, right? And if you multiply anything by 1, it just basically cancels out. So what we're going to do is just simplify this. We know that 5 to the 651 is equal to 5 to the 600, 5 to the 51 mod p, mod 7, right? That's true. Uh, well, there's a 6 there, so I'm going to say that's like 5 to the 100 to the 6. 5 to the, okay, 7, 49, right? So that's 49, 5 squared, right? Um, so that's 5 to the 100, 6. Uh, 5 squared, 7. Oh, I don't want 49. I want 6 times 8 is 48. That's going to be 2. Uh, 48 is 6 times 8, so I'm going to put the 8 here and the 6 here, and then I'll put the 5 squared here, right? Uh, yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. 
This is the, the computer is supposed to do this, you know. Um, what is 5 to the 100? I don't know and I don't care because when you take Fermat's little theorem, you raise it to the power of 6 mod 7. It doesn't matter what this number is. 5 to the 100 mod 7 is going to be either 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. Either way, it's going to be between, it's going to be between uh, some number there. So you simply raise it to the 6 and then you get the right answer, right? So that's going to be 1 times 1 times 5 cubed mod 7, right? So we reduced a big number, 651. Nothing really special about that. I just made up a number. And we did 5 cubed mod 7. And what is 5 cubed mod 7? Well, now we have to actually work it out because 3 is smaller than 7. So we don't get to do anything cool. Uh, we're stuck with that. Well, I know it's 49. Excuse me, not 49. It's going to be 25 times 5. And then what's 25 mod 7? 7, 7, 14, 21. So that's going to be 4. No. 7, 14, 21. Yeah, it's going to be 4 times 5 mod 7. And what's 4 times 5 mod 7? That's 20 mod 7. That's going to be 7. That's going to be 7, 14, 21. That's going to be 6. So that's 6 mod 7. OK. Computing. Did I any mistakes? Did I make any calculation errors? Sounds right. You double check my work for me. Thank God. Uh, 5 to the 651. I don't know what that is. It's big, unimaginable. It's crazy. But congrats, I just work modular arithmetic. I apply for mass level theorem. It's super simple. I get six. I didn't actually do any real calculation there, if you notice. I simply reduced the problem, and then I was able to do a minor amount of multiplication at the end. Right. Yes? So if the um, number is greater than the whatever you're modding it by, you can, since you're multiplying it, you can do piece by piece? Yes. So basically, I broke 651 into several pieces that were l multiples of six, because six is seven minus one. Because we want to a to the p minus 1, you're the 1 mod p. Then I was like, OK, 600 is just 100 to the 6. Then that's a 1, and so on. And the whole thing works out. But we have like a 25. So if you had like 25 like times 31, for example. 25 you, times 31? Like if you, could you do like um, 4 times uh, 6? For, um, 31 is prime, right? The, the, the rules I apply here at the end are that if, that if a mod p uh, times b mod p, or even mod n, this is going to into a b mod p. I should say mod n, but right? If you have a number which is a product of something, you can simplify that. And the best way to simplify that is to split it up into something that can be modded easily. I didn't want to, what is 5 cubed? I think you guys can do that one. That's 125. I don't want to do that. It's three digits. I don't have that many fingers. So what we go to do is I'm going to do 25, and then I'm, oh, 25 is already big enough for me. I'm, not gonna, I'm just going to focus on the 25. I'm working mod 7. There's only seven things that exist to me. 25 is not seven things. I'm just going to get rid of that one smaller first. Then I'm going to do the 20, and then I'm going to do this thing. the thing. The, the reason I'm saying it like this and being dramatic about it is the fact that modular arithmetic is so beautiful and powerful. You work with small things. Calculation is super easy. Don't get super big because you can always reduce to something super small. You know the final answer is going to be between 0 and 6. So I'm not going to get to, well, I'm not even going to think about 125. You know, otherwise, I mean, I could, actually. 125 mod 7 might not be impossible to do. What, what is 125 mod 7? 6. 6? Well, we know that now, I guess. <laughs> but you, you see what I'm saying, right? It's about, uh, the reason I'm doing it this way is to demonstrate quick calculation. So I would just if you had the A was twenty five and the B was thirty, like for example thirty one, then could you do Ah, so you the for math little theorem is specified when A is between zero and P, strictly. One and P. Ah. Right? So if you are saying you had twenty five to the what? No, no, no not not twenty five to to any I'm saying if you had twenty five and then times 31 mod p. I was, I was just wondering if you could do then, um, so it would be 4, and then times. Uh, what is 4? 7, sorry. Oh, yes. Would, would it be 4 times and then 3? So that would be 12 mod 7. I see. So you're doing. You're doing 31 mod 7, and you're doing 25 mod 7, and you're multiplying those together. So 25 mod 7 is going to be 4, and 31 mod 7 is going to be, what did you say it was? I think it's 3. 3? I think that sounds right. I mean, it's, uh, there's a 1 in 7 chance. So that's going to be 12. 
mod 7 is going to be 5. So yes. And actually, that's a great way to do modular arithmetic. You, I mean, if you were given 25 times 31 as something bigger, split it into 25 and 31, and then do the mod. Simplifies quicker, right? This is not like deep mathematics. It's just great, efficient ways to do calculation. For Maslow theorem, it's sort of an extra thing. It's not super important to number theory. But I'll tell you, I mean, it is important to number theory. It's maybe not important to this class. But it is like really useful because Taking small numbers to big exponents, mod a small number, happens really often, as we'll see Thursday. That's a very common thing that occurs. So you want to be able to compute that quickly. Not just you and I, pen and solid paper, but an algorithm to do so. It's a very common thing. All right. More questions on applying for Maslow theorem? Uh, here's another quick problem. Let's say you have uh, 2 to the p minus 1 squared uh, mod. Uh, P, what is that? I'm timing you guys, by the way, on this one. Where P is any prime number. One, why? Uh, I plugged in three. You plugged in three? Yeah, P, and then I saw it was one. Okay, well, certainly that's, um, yeah, that works, I guess. Here's the, here's the better way. Um, so we, sometimes this is like a, a cool exam question uh, I've done in 3510 sometimes, but like quickly people, people try to like factor and foil and then do all kinds of complicated cancellation. What is two to the P mod P? Two. two. What is 2 minus 1? What is 1 squared? Done. Right. Very complicated things. Mod, just it, it cascades. It falls out. Right. Again, the mod p can exist anywhere in the, in the function. Right. As long as it's not like in an exponent or a log of something or something weird. If it's like just a multiplicative there, it's going to be congruent to that. Right. Questions on this problem? Just an example of how to do something quickly. All right. So the next question you probably have is, what about if can we do fast calculation of exponents if p is not prime? What if we're doing mod n? Um, and the answer is yes, but it's a worse and more complicated uh, theorem. So we'll only prove part of it and not the whole thing. First, we define a special function called the Euler phi function. So we're going to prove Euler's theorem. And it's going to involve what's called the Euler phi function. Now, I don't know why I call it uh, Euler's theorem, but I call it the Euler, Euler phi function. But uh, I mean, it's spelled Euler, so I'm just going to keep it with that. Uh, Euler uh, was not the first to come up with this function. It was really studied by Gauss. Uh, the Euler phi function is uh, basically for n is the number of numbers or less than or equal to n relatively prime to n. So you want the number of numbers that are less than or equal to n and greater than or equal to 1 uh, relatively prime to n, right? So the number of numbers between 1 and n inclusive that are relatively prime to n, right? Uh, what is phi of, let's start with 2. What's phi of 2? How many numbers between 1 and 2 are relatively prime to 2? By the way, do we recall the, de the definition of what something is to be relatively prime? We say... Uh, a and B are relatively prime if uh, GCD of A and B is equal to 1. They are, in some sense, prime to each other, right? If a P, Q, any primes, 
then the GCD of PQ is going to be what? One. Right. So all primes are relatively prime, certainly. Certain other numbers are relatively prime to each other. What numbers between 1 and 2 are relatively prime? So 1 is relatively prime to all numbers. 2 is not relatively prime to itself. So this is going to be 1. Okay. What about um, 5, 3? Let's see if we can do a few calculations. What is 5, 3? We're going to consider the numbers 1, 2, and 3. Okay. Which of these do you take the GCD of it and do you get 1? Uh, 3 and 3 is not going to work. 3 and 2 will work, and 3 and 1 will work. So we see that 5, 3 is equal to 2. Right? What about uh, 5, 4? What do we think 5, 4 is, if you were to be quick about it? It's 2. The numbers less than equal to 4 that, uh, that don't divide into 4 are going to be 3 and 1. Right? 2 divides into 4 and 4 divides into 4. What about uh, 5? Three. What are the three numbers? What about four? Four numbers. Four and five are relatively prime. In fact, n and n plus one are always relatively prime. Um, what about, let's do one more. Let's do five, six. This is a little tricky one. What is five, six? Two. What are the two numbers? One and four. So let's see. One divides into it. Okay. Three? Three? Okay, let's write it out. One, two, three, four, five, six. Don't worry, we'll give a general formula for this, but we're trying to like see why, what's going on here. Um, one divides into it, and GCD of that is one, so one is relatively prime to everything. Two divides into six. Three divides into six. Four, GCD of four and six is two, which is not one. Uh, GCD of six. Did I do that right? So one and five? So it's just two. Oh, OK, yeah, that makes sense. So the GCD of, uh, excuse me, the Euler 5, 6 is just 2. Um, so you see it's got some interesting properties. It doesn't just monotonically increase. Um, it's actually quite maximal for prime numbers. And notice that for all of them, the number never divides into it. So it's at most p minus 1 anyway. Um, we're going to prove uh, several things about this. The Euler 5 function very interesting. And we actually will just mention and not prove several things. First off, we mentioned last time the multiplicative group mod n, where you only consider the numbers to in the group to be that those which are relatively prime. Uh, and it turns out that the cardinality of the group, z uh, mod nz, is actually just 5n, right? For example, we talked about, uh, we could, we, we, at the last second, we just kind of asked about what numbers are relatively prime to 12 mod 12. So 5, 12 is what? Well, what are the numbers? And then let's count the numbers. How many numbers between 1 and 12 are relatively prime? To 12. 1. What else? 5. What else? 7. 7. 11. 11. Yeah. So we get that this is, uh, this is the set, but this is just 4, right? So the multiplicative group mod, uh, mod 12 is going to only have 4 elements in it. It's pretty small. Um, but the multiplicative, multiplicative group mod 7 had 6 elements in it, right? Something like this. So Euler 5, first off, is interesting because people want to know the cardinality of the multiplicative group. That's the first reason people want to know it. Now, what is the explicit formula for computing the multiplicative, uh, for computing it? We're not going to prove the general way to derive the formula. It'll take too long. What we're going to do, though, is prove two special cases of it. I'll give you the general formula, which is that 5n is equal to n times, if p is a number which divides into n, then uh, 1 minus 1 over p, right? This is the, p is a prime number, and p is a divisor of n. Then you compute the product of 1 minus 1 over p times n. It's not even, I don't like this formulation of the Euler 5 function, simply for many reasons. This is kind of a weird notation, but it's very common. This means if p is a divisor of n, if p divides into n, then you multiply over that. That's sort of what your for loop is over. Two, it's not even obvious that it's a number. I mean, 1 over p, why Euler 5 function is a number of numbers. So it has to be a natural number, right? So, but this looks like it could be a fraction or something weird. So why, how does this even look like a number? Well, that's going to have all the factors of p in it anyway. You distribute that, it's going to be n over p is going to be a number because p divides n, right? So it, it ends up working out in the end. 
Um, but this is not the, the formulation I like. Here's the formulation I like, is that if, uh, if n is equal to, let's say, p1a1 times p2a2 times p3a3 times dot, 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 times uh, pkak, where uh, this is the prime factorization of n, and we proved last time that every number has a unique prime factorization, p1 would be 2, p3 would be p2 would be 3, p3 would be 5, and so on, right? Every number can be written as a product of prime powers. Then, in fact, phi of n is equal to uh, p1 to the a minus a1 minus 1, p1 minus 1, product, dot, 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 product, uh, pk to the ak, minus 1 times pk minus 1. Okay. So you compute the ith prime to 1 power minus, and then you subtract 1 from that prime number. You product those all together. That's going to give you your phi then. Um, as you can see, the Euler phi function is kind of cumbersome. The general formula of it is quite cumbersome. Um, in both cases, in order to compute the Euler phi function, you have to first off factor n. Right? To give it a number, you have to decompose it into its prime power. That is difficult, and we don't really like that. Uh, in general, we'll learn this Thursday, but taking a number and trying to compute its prime factors in general is a very hard problem for a computer to do. We really don't have any better algorithms for it than just smart brute force search. So everything, this is in general kind of a difficult thing to do, computing Euler phi. The better thing to do if I asked you to compute like Euler phi of 13 or something. It's just to work through it manually. Um, I'm going to mention one more property of the Euler phi function, and then we'll uh, prove two special cases of it, of when it's a prime or a product of primes. Um, if the GCD of n and m is equal to 1, then phi of n, m is equal to phi of n times phi of m. GCD is, uh, you guys can see better. Uh, Euler phi is what's considered a multiplicative function. A few functions have a property like this, right? One this may be familiar to is logs, right? The product of AB of log of AB is equal to log of A plus log of B. It's not quite multiplicative, but this is sort of an interesting splitting thing that's going on, right? It's kind of cu curious. Um, but you can only split it this way if GCD of nm is 1, if n and m are relatively prime, right? 2 squared cannot be split into 2, G, uh, 5, 2, 5, 2, right? But uh, you can split the prime powers up this way, certainly. Um, we're going to prove two special cases of the Euler phi function, and only those two special cases. Uh, if p is a prime, then uh, phi of p is equal to what? P minus 1. P minus 1. This almost is so obvious it doesn't need a proof. Uh, there are uh, p numbers between 1 and p. Because p is prime, the only divisors of, I'll just write it out. Um, since a p is prime, the only uh, numbers which uh, divide into it, into it, are 1 and p. Right? So, uh, all numbers between 1, p are relatively prime to p, except p. 
so there are p minus 1 such numbers. Confirm this with your own calculation because, you know, phi, uh, phi of 5 is 4, right? None of the numbers divided into it, obviously. So if you compute a prime number, phi of a prime number is simply p minus 1. It's very simple. Questions on that? Um, if p, q are primes and p does not equal q, then phi of pq, you should expect to be what? Kind of a tricky. Let's apply this one. Oh, I'm pointing at the wrong board. I'm pointing at the wrong board again. OK. Phi of pq, you would expect to be what? Now, this requires that p does not equal q, because p squared is not p minus 1 squared. If p does not equal q, they have to be different primes. Um, here's the proof. We're going to sort of do it by an example. Consider 15, phi of 15. What we're going to do is write out the numbers 1 through 15 and then cross them out. 1, 2, 3, 4. No, that's too, too, too spacious. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. OK, hopefully that's clear. So 3, all the things that divide into 15 are either multiples of 3 or multiples of 5. Those are the only two possibilities, or both. So let's simply cross out, cross out every multiple of 3. 3, 6, 9, 12, 15. OK. Uh, let's cross out every multiple of 5. How many multiples of 5 are there? 5, 10, 15. Um, there are 15 possible numbers. Five of them multiples of 3. Three of them multiples of both. Oh, excuse me, multiples of 5. Only one is a multiple of both. So we double counted the term 15. That's the only one that's multiple of both. Let's just generalize this. Consider 5 pq. Uh, pq possible numbers. q multiples of p. And p, and excuse me, and then p multiples of q. Uh, one is a multiple of both. So we take pq total numbers, and we subtract <coughs> off all the multiples of p. How many multiples of p are there? They're pq over p, which is q. So you remove all the multiples of p, and you subtract q possibilities. How many multiples of q are there? p of them, so you should subtract p. But here, you've accidentally double counted pq. So you have to, it's counted twice, inclusion, exclusion, basically. You have to add one. You add it back in. So you want to subtract it twice. This is the exact, then we know that phi of pq is then equal to exactly this number. But if you FOIL that, what do you get? Yeah, it's, this is just p minus 1, q minus 1. QED. Mm, you can prove uh, if you you can prove the closed formula this way. Uh, prove this multiplicative property. Uh, then proved 
through a similar counting argument that a single prime power is equal to this, and then that's sufficient to prove the closed form of uh, the Euler phi function. Um, this is called a semi-prime when it's a product of two distinct primes. It's almost a prime. It's not a, quite a prime. But this is what we call a semi-prime. Right? Yes? P and Q, um, they're prime, right? Correct. Yeah. Normally, we'll, we, P in general, if you see P at all, it's a, it's a prime. If you see I, it's like a looping variable. You see N, it's a number. K, a number. P is a prime. And when you're working with more than one prime, sometimes you'll say P and Q. They're like twins. This sort of notation. P and Q must be prime, yes. Questions on this one? Why am I uh, talking about uh, the Euler phi function and all its interesting possibilities? Well, primarily because we can use it to prove something called the Euler, Euler's theorem. I should not have erased for Matt's little theorem because it's basically the same thing. Uh, Euler's theorem is if the GCD of A and P, uh, A and N, excuse me, is congruent to, is equal to 1, then uh, A to the phi of N is congruent to 1 mod N. By then, may be difficult to calculate. If n is a prime, then you just get Fermat's little theorem, right? Let me restate Fermat's little theorem. If uh, 1 is less than equal to a is less than uh, p, then a to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod p, right? Notice that if you take you, Euler's theorem, you just set n to be p, and p is a prime, you just get Fermat's little theorem. Why? What is phi of n if n is a prime? It's just going to be p minus 1. What, what, for what numbers, is, is, what numbers are relatively prime to n if n is prime? All of them, actually. So it's just you change the condition from GCD to just be any number between 1 and p. right? And that's it. So Euler's theorem, Euler's theorem, very simple at computing, uh, can help us compute mods, unless the mod is something weird like a product of like a many, many complex numbers. And uh, computing the Euler phi function is difficult. But let's do an example to help us calculate something. What is 7 to the 821 mod 15? Right? 15 is not prime, but it's a semi prime, it's almost prime. So what we can do is just apply uh, Euler's theorem, Euler's theorem, and we get basically almost the same thing that we get when we did um, for Matt's little theorem. So what is uh, phi of 15? Uh, wait, I, I just, uh, is uh, in Euler theorem, uh, do n need to be prime? No, that's the great part. For Matt's little theorem, n must be prime. For Euler's theorem, n can be any number. It could be even something that's really hard to compute, the uh, Euler phi function. By the way, the phi function is sometimes called the totient function. It can be any number. So this is a generalization of it, right? You take for Matt's little theorem, you generalize it for when n is not prime, you'll get Euler's theorem. If you specialize Euler's theorem, you get for Matt's little theorem, right? It works especially when n is not prime. What is phi of 15? 8? True? Yeah. Here's one quick way to do that. That's phi of 3 times 15, 3 times 5, which is just phi of 3. Phi of 5, which is just 2 times 4 is 8, right? You could also just count it for such small number, but quickly doing the multiplicative property, it's quick. Um, so we basically want to write like 821 is equal to like, I don't know, uh, Q five N plus R somehow. So when we can simplify that down, we'll get the answer that we want. So um, how did I simplify this? 
we know 5n is 8, right? And well, we have an 800 there, thankfully. So we have 7 times 7 to the 800, 7 to the 21, mod 15, right? We know that this is congruent then to 7 to the 800 is just 7 to the 100 to the 8. And this is 7. What is 21 to the 8? That's going to be um, 16 plus 5, right? So we're going to get 7 to the 16, 7 to the 5. And that's going to be congruent to uh, 7 to the 100 to the 8, uh, 7 squared to the 8, 7 to the 5, which is then just congruent to 7 to the 5, uh, mod 15. So great, we've simplified again something big, 7 to the 821. We don't have to calculate it. By the way, this would work just as well if you did 821,000 or something, right? You'd have to do it a little differently, but it can do arbitrarily large mods this way. Um, 7 to the 5, how are we going to compute that? I am going to compute it shorthand this way. I know that's 7 squared squared. So it's gonna, I'm going to do 49 squared times 7 mod 5, 15. That's the way I'll compute that one. And what is 49 mod 15? 4. four. So we get 4 squared times 7, which is 16 times 7. What is 16 mod 15? 1. one. It was just 7. Quick way to do 7 to the 5, in fact. Right. So the, these theorems on their own have interesting mathematical properties, but the point for today is that calculation is quite quick. You can make something big into something reasonable and small, quite with, with patience. Uh, more questions on the two theorems of today? All right. Take a little break.